Hello and welcome to Talking Africa here on Arise News, a special weekly edition of Africa Wrap where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world in an hour of conversation with African commentators, thought leaders and high achievers. Well, my special guest this week has certainly experienced highs and lows in his life in a career that has spanned six decades and three continents, but with Africa always close to his heart. Even now at the age of 81 and living in London, he is still an active author as well as being a writer. Joseph Godson Amamu has worked as a teacher, journalist, public relations advisor, broadcaster, lecturer, government ambassador and minister and also a barrister. Welcome, Joseph. That is some CV you've got there. Thank you very much. And nice being here. Thank you very much for coming in. Let's start, if I can, by asking about your early life, all of which is laid out in your book, My African Journey. Um, you were born in Ghana and you grew up there. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, I had a very privileged uh, childhood until my father died early uh, at the age of 35 when I was about six. And from that time, it was grueling hardship, deprivation and suffering uh, because um, his heirs, by tradition, were to look after me well. On, it turned out that it wasn't so. It was very hard life, and uh, it was six, seven years that I always remember with much unhappiness. So you were very, very young, obviously suffered the pain of having your father die, um, and then you also had the added familial pressures of... Yes, indeed. And how did you cope with that? It was very difficult, very difficult indeed, and... Uh, the sort of experiences which I went through, I uh, wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And they what, were really very bad. What kind of experiences were they? Uh, sort of having to do a ha household chores that normally would be done by adults and uh, with a little bit of booting to boot, beating here and there for looking back for no good reason, uh, uh, breaking a plate or not... Be, uh, coming home from school in time. And uh, looking back, I often ask myself that it's partly the, the sort of treatment of uh, the children in Africa that tend to uh, delimit development. Because I'm quite sure if I hadn't gone through all that beating and harassment and uh, deprivation, maybe I would have grown taller and bigger and perhaps more intelligent. Not at all. Well, you, you, you came through that and you talk about intelligence. You, you went to, to Ghana to, you wanted to study medicine, but in Ghana at that time, you couldn't study medicine anyway. So you came to the UK. And what kind of a leap was that like coming across to the UK? Well, it was very pleasant to come here. And uh, I was quite surprised how different it was from the country I had come from. After a voyage of uh, 14 days on the, on the high seas, uh, I couldn't afford even a third class by boat. I had to go by fourth class. It was a French boat where you are allowed to come up for fresh air once a day and go back down. But it was an experience. And uh, when I came, what struck me was that you, I didn't see any people, poor people about begging. And uh, I was also struck that unlike where I had come from, there were no expecting women going about. And as a young man, I asked myself, surely these people must have children, and I don't see any women <laughs> going about. Until friends told me, ah, uh, Joseph, they are in Perda, and uh, they, they, they are confined. And I said, now I understand, I understand. But gradually one got uh, used to the country and the um, conditions here and the climate, coming from a very hot country, to a cold, wet country. And after some time, one adjusted. And what was it like? What did your family think of your incredible trip, 14 days on a boat? What did your family think of such a big leap to come here to the UK? My mother was very apprehensive. In fact, was actually in tears when I was boarding, uh, boarding the boat. They didn't want me to come. But I felt that at that time in my life, Coming over was the only major move that I could make towards developing myself for the future. 
while you were at university, you started writing for the local newspaper. Um, and is that where your desire to be a journalist came from? Yes, that is indeed. I, but although I was studying science, I was interested in the uh, political affairs and uh, local issues. And I started writing articles for the local paper. And uh, the fees were very good. So they helped to supplement the allowance which we were getting our students. You wrote a book called The New Ghana about yeah. Ghana's origins. Yes. Um, so that was your first book, very young to write a book then. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and why you decided to do that. I must say I owe a lot to my, some English friends because just at that time before independence, quite a few came to uh, the Gold Coast, as it was called then, and collected material about the country and its progress towards independence. Next thing I heard was that some of them were on, on the BBC World Service being introduced as experts on Africa. And I said to myself, how? Oh, I met this chap at the hotel only two weeks ago. So how could he go back, write a book, and become an expert? And I, born in the country, knowing the language, the customs and the traditions of the people, why can't I do something similar? Especially, as George Bernard Shaw said, you don't need a PhD to write a book. So I started gathering material about the past of the country, the progress towards independence, put material together, sent it to England. It was rejected five times. Then eventually, suddenly, somehow, Pan Books told me they had accepted it. And at this point, you'd been working as a science teacher, and you realized that your initial advance for that book was 20 times the salary Indeed. you were getting. I, I just couldn't believe it. When I read the letter from Pan Books based somewhere in... Uh, some point near Hard Park Corner. I read it again and again to be sure I was reading the right thing. And eventually I got used to it that it was true and I accepted the offer. So you thought from then on writing and a, a career in journalism is for you and you, you um, arrived um, and you became the correspondent for the Ghanaian Times. Indeed. Um, becoming the, the only black journalist in the capital at that time. What was that like? It was very pleasant in the sense that being the only African uh, journalists at that time, all issues are pertaining to Africa, although I couldn't claim to know all, the whole of Africa. But invariably, I was called on for interviews, my comments, my views on Africa and all that. And uh, the fees at that time were very, very handy. Plus the fact that uh, socially, I got to know uh, a lot of people from uh, cabinet ministers to even rag and bone men. So I had a very pretty good idea of the country and the people for the period I was here as a journalist. Yeah, sounds like great variety and also great to be taken so seriously on issues, as you say, a country you may never have been to and Indeed. you sit there and everyone listens to you. Um, you also then took up um, and decided to study to be a barrister. Tell us about that and why you, why you made that leap. Uh, originally, I came to study medicine and after uh, three or four interviews, Manchester University, uh, Liverpool, one or two others, again and again, I was given only conditional uh, uh, offer. And I kept on waiting, waiting, and eventually I decided that, well, I couldn't wait indefinitely. So one day, walking from uh, uh, Temple Chief Station towards my office in Fleet Street, I saw a building with a sign on Middle Temple. So I walked in, asked the gentleman at the reception, is this way they do law? He said, yes. I said, what are the minimum requirements? And he told me, and I happened to have them. So there and there, I pulled pull the check from my breast pocket, signed the check for the fee, and registered as a student. And that's how I started studying for the bar. And what age were you then? Uh, 59, I must have been about 20. 25, you know. There we go, 25, and you're already on your third career, <laughs> making everyone here feel really bad about themselves. Um, you then, um, you, your career moved on somewhat when you, um, when you met the Prime Minister of Ghana at Heathrow, covering his visit. Tell us about that. What happened then? Yeah, it was June 58, and he was, uh, Dr. Nkrumah, was uh, attending the, the conference as the first African to be uh, uh, attending the Commonwealth Conference. So the Ghanaian students and citizens went to the airport to meet him. I was introduced to him in line, and then he asked, you small boy wrote that book? And I said, 
politely yes. And from that time, a job after a job without my applying came my way. There we go. Just so impressed by the book that you'd written at such yes, a young age indeed. and obviously about things that he related to. Joseph, all very interesting. We're going to continue talking to you in a short while. We're going to take a very quick break here, though. But when we come back, we will be talking to Joseph Godson Amamu about how his first book proved to be a springboard towards a career in the public service and the Ghanaian government. Do stay with us. The best way to predict the future is to create it. There's a special breed of achievers out there called tomorrow's people. They imagine what will be and strive to make it happen. They refuse to wait for the future. Tomorrow bends and conforms to their ideas. At Access Bank, we share the same sentiments. Our mantra for success is simple. Speed, service, and security. Tomorrow's people own the future because they keep the world turning. That is the power of taking tomorrow. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. Let's continue with my guest, the author Joseph Godson Amamu. Um, Joseph, your first book proved to be a springboard towards a career in the public service. Just yes, how indeed. did that come about? Uh, I was fortunate in the fact that it was the first book on uh, Ghana, especially so by an African, by a Ghanaian. And uh, there, were, there were no books dealing with the country and its background and how it became independent and all that. So overnight, it became a bestseller, not only in this country, but in America, to my great surprise. And uh, that's how my, the government got to know about me and what I've been doing and all that. So initially, you were appointed as the first public relations advisor to the Ghanaian embassy in, in London. In London, yeah. And what exactly did that entail in terms of your role there? Uh, what happened was that whilst I was a London correspondent of the Ghanaian Times, often there were critical articles in the British press about Ghana and Dr Nkrumah, the Prime Minister, and what he was doing. So they felt that they needed a public relations man at the embassy who would liaise with the British media and explain things, why things are being done and what our position on this and all that. And uh, they decided that perhaps I was the right man. That's why I moved from my little office in Fleet Street to the embassy. And you later became the Ghanaian ambassador to Hungary and the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. Yes. And what you describe as a rather torrid time of it with a Hungarian journalist. Tell us more. Uh, yeah, generally, life was very pleasant. 
But unfortunately, I fell into a honeypot trap, and uh, there were complications here and, <laughs> here and there. But eventually, I got out of it, and I found that the solution was to marry quickly and uh, stop the whole thing, you know. There we go. Um, uh, that, that seems to have worked out for you. Of course, you overcame the issue and married your Irish-British fiancé, yes. um, and you returned to London. Um, what happened next when you, when you came back? After Hungary, we went back to Ghana, and then uh, we decided that, uh, for family reasons, we'd come back. So we came back, plus the fact that I needed medical attention. So uh, we came back, and whilst here, there was a, a military coup in Ghana, and the government was overthrown. But fortunately for me, touch wood, I had by then been dismissed by the government so the new military government decided that I was the right man to be editor of the paper that I used to represent when I was a London correspondent here. Because by that time, all the editors had been arrested, arrested and locked up. So your name wasn't anywhere near that because you'd stopped working for them for long exactly. enough to be removed from... Exactly. That's what saved me. And during all of this time, are you in contact with your family back in Ghana? Because obviously it was much harder then to be in contact than it is today. Were you writing letters? Were they, was anyone coming to see you? Oh, yes. I was writing letters and also I could phone. Although at that time the phone had to be uh, uh, sort of transmitted through Paris and this station and that. But it wasn't a direct as it is now. But we were in contact. And you were the newspaper's editor of the Ghanaian Times here. Um, uh, uh, in Accra. In Ghana. Accra. Yeah. Um, and um, you... you this brought about responsibility and a public profile um, and attracted some early anonymous and abusive letters. Yes. Who was writing these Indeed. abusive letters? They not were, that Hungarian journalist again. No, not the Hungarian journalist. But there were people who felt that I was uh, ambassador of the previous government which had been overthrown. They didn't know that for nine months before the coup, I was no longer in the service of the government. So they felt that... Uh, I would misuse my position to facilitate the return of Nkrumah, and that was a, a big fear at that time. Plus the fact that I had politi political enemies who felt that I've had it two ways. I served under the previous regime and under the new regime to have been appointed. So I used to get anonymous uh, telephone calls and abuse here and there, but it was all part of the territory, part of the terrain, why well, had to accept it? Sounds like you played it very well, Joseph. You also say in your book that your time at the Ghanaian Times ended slightly controversially. Yeah, what happened was that towards the, uh, my two-year period, the military government were deciding what to do with the, the members of the previous government. And at that time, the anti-Nkrumah feeling was such that there were people who were demanding that they should all be banned from public office for life and should be imprisoned for life. All sort of very horrendous suggestions. And I stood up and wrote a series of articles saying that taking what happened in Nazi Germany as uh, an example, although not comparable in any way what happened in Ghana, but what happened in, uh, in Germany after the war was that the the terrorist allies concentrated only on the leading figures in the Nazi regime. They didn't issue orders locking up the whole of the German population of 60 or 70 million people. So I kept on suggesting to the military government that please concentrate on the very, very top few and leave the journalists, the drivers, the chauffeurs and cooks, leave them alone. Uh, the public were demanding that everybody who in one way, way or another was connected with the old regime must uh, be punished or thrown out of public service. And looking back, I'm happy that I stood firm and said that this is wrong. You can't lock up a whole country. It was the leadership that got them to where they are, just as in Germany. The ordinary people were worried about their children's education, their mortgage, and all that. It was the leadership that got them to work, the, the disaster and the catastrophe. So after a series of articles and uh, plea with the military government, which wasn't easy, seeing the, the inside of the barrel of a gun isn't easy.
but I kept on, and eventually the military government accepted many of my proposals, and they toned down the original decree, which was going to ban so many people. They reduced the list to very, very few people. So your time at the Ghanaian Times ended on principle, essentially, and you then were already planning a next chapter in your life, becoming a minister in Ghana, yes. something that your mother helped you campaign to get that yes, job, although she didn't want you to have it. That, that was so. Uh, towards the end of my period as uh, editor, the military government decided to hand over to the civilian government. So the jockeying for position started. One, one party against the other one, this one, and I decided that I would join the party which originally was opposed to Nkrumah because I felt that on, prin on principle, if we didn't know at first that corruption and uh, sort of human rights abuses were going after the coup, all these details came out. So I couldn't be uh, aligned with the very f party which it had been proved was responsible for these things. So it made many people take me to be sort of uh, uh, a chameleon. I mean, somebody not trustworthy. And I said, no. Cardinal Newman, John Wilson Churchill and others changed political positions again and again depending on the, what was at issue. So I decided that, although it looked odd, that now I, I didn't join the party that originally had made me ambassador, uh, gone to the other side. I felt that, on principle, that was the right thing to do, and I did. Then uh, I stood for my town, my hometown, Aguna Suedru, and as I said, my mother, or, at first, was very reluctant for fear something might happen to me or somebody would beat me up or something like that. But once she came on board, she gave full moral and financial support, and I won by a landslide. And that's how I became an MP. It's a fascinating tale. Um, do stay there because we're going to take a very short break now. But when we come back, we will talk to Joseph Godson Amamu about his time in government and his ultimate arrest, which led to his imprisonment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. We are joined by the author, Joseph Godson Amamu. Um, Joseph, um, you were sworn in as Deputy Minister for Health and later became Deputy Minister for Lands and Mineral Resources. What was it like as a minister and what impact did it have on you and your family? It was very hectic in, in that often you get unscheduled visitors. Not only black people, white people too were doing it. Pop in, your secretary tells you, Mr. So-and-so from London wants to see you. No appointment, nothing. But they were doing what the Africans were doing. And uh, one tried to cope with all these unscheduled visits, plus numerous telephone calls. And when Parliament was sitting, one had to find time for, to go to Parliament also. And in addition to the admin work in the office, reading the voluminous reports and documents and all that. So it was very, very hectic. And you had to deal with a number of crises in your yes. time as minister, including a cholera outbreak. Yes. Just after we have been to uh, office, there was a cholera outbreak. And uh, I think the first in the country, it was very difficult and very challenging. But our government handled it very well. I was uh, instructed to go to the north, where it was very rampant, to talk to the people about general hygiene and what to do to minimize the impact of the disease. And uh, on the whole, we were able to contain it uh, 
within a reasonable time with the result that not so many people died. And I really enjoyed the little bit one day to help to save lives. And you were um, trying to introduce a number of health programs, including an anti-malaria drugs. You were told yeah. there were no funds. That's true. Just how frustrating was that, trying to, trying to make this difference, being told we just can't afford it? It was indeed very frustrating. During that period as Deputy Minister, I was invited by the U.S. Secretary of State for a 10, week, ten weeks uh, coast to coast tour of the United States, visiting hospitals, clinics, universities. And that's, so I got ideas of, to introduce to Ghana, but when I came, anything I brought up, sadly, there wasn't the money. I wanted, for example, to introduce anti-malarial uh, uh, medicines, and at that time, a new, a new invention, heart-lung machine, which I'd seen in America, I wanted to introduce, and again, again, it was the same pro problem, no funds. And so. your time as a government minister came to an abrupt end. Mm -hmm. 13th of January 1972, a date which you say is the worst day of your life. Yes, very much so. Two days before that, my wife and I had entertained some British and other businessmen, uh, lavish dinner, everything going smooth and lovely. And the following morning, my driver came in and told my wife, who was then preparing the children for school, that there'd been a coup. My wife said, where? Thinking it was somewhere <laughs> in another part of Africa. And the driver's, driver said, here. So my wife said, this is complete nonsense. How could it be? Because our government was very popular. Wherever we went, our opinion poll ratings were very, very high. And all. So there was no question of ever being a coup. And uh, it happened. So I decided that I had to go and check with the BBC. At that time, there were no other... Uh, uh, media outlets. I tuned into the BBC and it confirmed that there had been a coup. I, I, I nearly collapsed listening to it. And for a few seconds, I just didn't know what was happening. So I decided that, well, rather than w wait to be uh, caught and beaten up or possibly shot, I must start taking uh, appropriate measures. So I took off my suit, put on a nondescript t shirt. And instead of my usual position at the back of the car, I sat with the driver in front to be sure that they wouldn't recognize me. And they, we went around the military barracks, which weren't far from where we lived. We found a few soldiers standing here and there. So we thought, oh, it will be a nine-day wonder. The coup will be over 10. And we came home. The, the, the radio reports went on again and again that all ministers, deputy ministers, and top Party officials were to report to the nearest police station or would be dealt with militarily, which meant you would be caught, beaten well, and possibly shot. So I decided that, well, rather than being beaten and shot, I better go and report. Often my English friends ask me, why, why did you go to report? And I said, you have no idea what the circumstances were. Sounds so like I went made... to report, and I was told that there had been no instructions from the head office for arrest to be made, because apparently the head of the police at that time had refused to cooperate with the military over the coup. So I went home and started uh, collecting my things together, burning one or two sensitive documents, <laughs> and uh, taking appropriate measures. Started going to um, find friends who could help me. Uh, so, to my surprise, friends, both black and white, had all disappeared. And ultimately, we need to, we need to move on, but ultimately you, you went to prison and you spent 17 months in prison? No, 15 months. 15 months. Tell us briefly about that time. The prison conditions were very, very hard. We asked the coup wasn't expected. They had made no provision for us. So they moved from the, the medical wing of the prison, all their patients, to join their the, the fellow uh, convicts, and we were all ushered in. It was like a hospital ward. But we were so many that some of us had to sleep on the floor in the suits in which we were arrested. And I got used to using my right hand as my pillow for, for, for the first few days. And uh, our first uh, supper, 10 p.m., the day we were arrested, I got, we were called 
in, in alphabetical order. And my name standing with A, I got the head of the herring. You know herring? The fish, not the whole thing, the head. And I look at the two eyes of the herring, and they looked at me, and I said, gone are the days in London when I had my own white housemaid bringing my tea at the appropriate time. Here I was looking at the head of the herring. A real culture shock. Um, you were eventually released, as you say, 15 months yes, later. Indeed. Tell us about the circumstances surrounding that. What, why did you get out in the end? From the time we were in prison, there was a lot of pressure, especially from the uh, churches, that we should be released or at least put uh, on house arrest. And this pressure kept on mounting, 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 and uh, the traditional leaders also put pressure on the military government that uh, they should uh, release us. Meanwhile, we were all put before tribunals to account for all the money you've earned since you started working. Can you imagine in your 50s having to account for all the money, the holidays, where you stayed, who paid for them, your children's education and all that? And anything you couldn't explain was presumed to be illegally acquired and you didn't get it back. Luckily, and I, I'm proud to say touch wood, the report which I still have cleared me completely. Although at that time I had two houses in England and two houses in Ghana, there was evidence that long before I became a government minister, I had done reasonably well in life. So well, it's a lesson also, isn't it, to be to, to, to have as many friends as you can and to be as nice as people because you never know what's going to happen exactly. when a regime is going to change. And I guess that moves us on to your book here, um, which I'm sure it obviously talks about your life in, in general and, and everything that you went through. Um, but also, um, is there any overriding theme or message within the book that you think is a very important lesson in life that you've learned through all of your experiences? Is there anything that really stands out as something that you think everyone should be doing these days? Uh, I, I will, at my age, uh, say that I found that education is very important, not only for Africans, but even in this country, after 35 years living here, I found that without education, life becomes very, very difficult and uh, life becomes a bit easier when you've had formal education, apart from the fact that a few who never went to university or anywhere, uh, Lord Sugar, and became billionaires, but we are not Lord, uh, I'm not uh, Sugar and others. Education, 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 plus the fact that one must always try to do the right thing and have friends. You can never tell when the day of reckoning will come you may need those friends. Absolutely. It's a great message to end on. Education, education, education. As Tony Blair once said, obviously Indeed. in Nigeria um, fairly recently. Joseph, thank you very much for coming in. It's been fascinating. Thanks a lot. It's been a great time. pleasure being thank here. You. Thank you very much indeed. Well, my thanks to Joseph Godson Amamu. Stay with us to meet this week's Talking Africa panel as we look back at the week that's been. The big stories, the big issues. Gavin Ramjorn continues conversation in London with our next guests right here after this short break. Please stay with us. There is a reason Africa is called the new frontier. What was once potential is now an opportunity ready to be seized. Once revered for our resources, today's wealth lies in our people. People who build the cities that shape the future. People who know an idea in one place means business in another. A generation for whom technology means there are no borders, no boundaries. We are the new lions in a brave new world. Kings of the urban jungle. And there's a bank that puts the world in our pocket and the future in our hands. UBA, Africa's global bank. 
Welcome back to Talking Africa on Arise News with me, Gavin Ramjorn, picking up the conversation in London with our special weekly edition of Africa Wrap, where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world in an hour of conversation with African commentators and thought leaders. Celebrations have been taking place in Liberia this week after the World Health Organization announced that the country is now officially Ebola free. The government declared a public holiday and thousands of relieved local people took to the streets and the beaches where they were previously banned from going to celebrate. The virus killed more than 4,700 people in Liberia in just six months. Faith Thor has this report. It is a tribute to the government and people of Liberia that determination to defeat Ebola never wavered. Courage never faltered. Doctors and nurses continued to treat patients even when supplies of personal protective equipment and training in its safe use were inadequate. <laughs> I just came on the beach to enjoy myself because I'm alive. The Ebola did not take my life and none of my family's life were taken away by Ebola. So I came on the beach to just enjoy myself. Now comes the challenge. The challenge of working with our two neighboring countries to make sure they reach the same level of progress that we have reached. And already, we have commenced the process, taking a regional approach, reaching across borders to share information, to share experiences, to share talent. Well, time now to welcome my guests, security analyst Temi Tope Olodo and Douglas Pollin from the Association of African-Owned Businesses here in London. Gents, thank you very much indeed for coming in. So amazing accomplishments uh, then from the country uh, that in September wondered if Ebola would essentially wipe out the country. So yeah. how, how good is this then? How, should, how happy should they be feeling about this? Well, I think it's, um, it's worth celebrating, not only in uh, Liberia but across Africa. Because this is, this was a, a situation that could have caused a complete wipe off of that, of that country, and so it is worth celebrating. But I think the people need to be celebrated because you mm -hmm. know they stood together as one, you know, and the president did excellent in terms of how she managed the situation, leading from the front, which is not what you see mainly in Africa. So she actually did. Excellent. She performed well. So, yeah, Ellen, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, yes. of course, the president there, she faced intense public and political pressure um, to go back to traditional burials, didn't she, um, yeah. when the country was in need of cremation. So how, much of a, a, how, how strong was her leadership in that instance? Yeah, it was very strong. I mean, this is a fantastic out outcome for Africa. Um, it's one of those few very powerful success stories coming out of the continent this year. Mm. Um, as, as Temi said um, earlier on, um, it put like a lot of fear in people's hearts because they're well, like this this very contagious disease in very underdeveloped society, and um, we're expecting like much worse results. But obviously, mm -hmm. they've dealt with it in a fantastic way. 
and you know the government needs a lot of credit, but so do other organisations like Medicine Sans Frontier, who yes. uh, were part of the coordinated efforts to get rid of Ebola in the country. Definitely. So how much but, do they need credit for this as well? well they, they should take the credit, and the, because uh, uh, MSF actually really worked hard, you know, and we know that a lot of um, research work was done. People were working overnight. A lot of doctors lost their lives. Lots mm. of them actually got ill, you know, in the process. And you know, and it's all about how the country was able to work, you know, uh, seemingly mm. with other international bodies and you know, community leaders in trying to drive home, you know, some of the practices and processes, ensuring that the systems are in place and the processes were actually followed through. You know, a lot of people are looking at it from the medical perspective mm. alone, but actually this involves a lot of logistic, you know, moving things from one point to another, ensuring we know that a lot of ministers were actually suspended or even sacked because, you know, they, 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 they breached protocol that the president put down. It was strict protocol. So everybody was leading by example. And mm. I think this is something that and, and MSF definitely need to be acknowledged and recognized for the immense work they did during the period. And Douglas, when you look at the uh, the way that the, the region, particularly the region, Liberia uh, and, and Guinea and Sierra Leone, the, the three worst affected countries with Ebola, how they were portrayed across the continent. Um, you know, the African Cup of Nations, we take that as an example. Yeah. There were many uh, countries that were scared of having people from who travelled in the region visit their countries. You know, Morocco pulled out of hosting the tournament. So how much now will this bit of news go to help repairing relations uh, around the continent and around the world with these three countries? Um, what I'm hoping is it's um, going to boost confidence. Uh, you can see um, a lot of economic activity coming back. Um, it's quite sad with that, but um, I, I think no, at the time no one knew exactly like how big this was going to get mm. so everyone had to take like all the different countries like Mor Morocco as you mentioned had to take precautions because they didn't want to bring this upon themselves um, but I'm, I'm quite confident that um, with this report now um, people will be looking to go back into Liberia and do business mm. I'm expecting that um, maybe um, maybe in a few months time things will come back to normal mm. um, I, I had a conversation with someone and I, this was a few months back, I was saying it's going to take probably five years for things to come back to normal, but like, I think in the next 12 months we'll see it all turn around in Liberia, possibly. What lessons do you think uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone can learn from Liberia's case here? I think one of the things that could be learned is that there is need for strong institutions. Uh, you don't wait till when you know um, trouble knocks on your door before you put your house in order. And it's about having proper risk you know, analysis in place to deal with different issues. And you know, countries are now looking at what has happened. You know, those three countries, especially in Liberia, and how they manage this issue that uh, rocked uh, Syria alone did not actually occur in in Liberia there was nothing about you know money going to ghost workers and things like that so th this these are good examples and I think these are things that you know, sir, um, no, uh, Liberians could be quite proud of that they have actually overcome this very dangerous disease but more importantly I think we should also give kudos to the world even though the world was a bit slow in dealing with this issue but we're hearing about things like our businessmen are now ready to go back into Liberia and help to ensure that you know that country comes back again to their feet. Temi Douglas thank you very much indeed for that we'll take a short break uh, now but when we come back the cost of poverty and malnutrition in Malawi stay with us.
Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. A new report has calculated the cost of food poverty in one of Africa's poorest countries. The World Food Programme says that malnutrition in the country's children costs the economy of Malawi around $600 million a year. The study revealed that in a four-year period, 82,000 child deaths were due to a lack of food and more than half of Malawi's infants suffer from stunted growth caused by poor nutrition. Nicola Butler has this report. An infant is measured to check its growth. 60% of the working population in Malawi suffer from stunted growth before they reach the age of five. The good news, it can be prevented, but much work still needs to be done. Mothers and children queue at a health facility. The World Food Programme helps to provide 840,000 children with porridge at school. Malawi is paying a high price for child hunger, with an estimated 10% of gross national product lost each year. In this densely populated landlocked country, 80% of the population live in rural areas and the economy highly dependent on agriculture. Life expectancy is 60 years and more than half the population live below the poverty line. With money in short supply, for the people of Malawi, they hope the food continues long after the funds dry up. Nicola Butler, Arise News. Well, still with me in the studio are the security analysts Temi Topi Olado and Douglas Pollin from the Association of African-Owned Businesses here in London. So this report really is quite shocking, isn't it, Temi, when you look at how many of the nation's infants are affected by malnutrition. I think this is uh, uh, a country that uh, actually took its hands off the ball. Uh, we're talking of a country of over 16 million people, you know, uh, landlocked, you know, um, a cultural mainly based country where 90 percent of the population are on less than two dollars you know uh, so it's it's a country that actually had you know taking its eyes off the situation and not actually have a proper program in place to address this issue and that's why you know the report coming out is quite shocking what do you think the government can actually do to, to get this situation sorted out? Because they need to, to collaborate with a lot of people here, don't they? Yeah, I think the first and most important thing is education. They need to teach their people how to fend for themselves in terms of bringing in technology to help them farm, grow their own food. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you're talking about um, half of the population of children being malnourished, that's one in two. And if you have one in two children being stunted yeah. mm. in the next 20 years will be one in two adults. I mean, it, they'll keep paying for this for a very, very long it, It's time to start calling for help. Ask the African Union, ask the EU, ask, uh, probably ask the United States mm. World Food Program, the UN. Everyone has to come in to help this country because if they don't, and this situation gets worse, um, I mean, Malawi is looking at a very bleak future, to be honest. It's a very good point you raise about the knock-on effects with the, with the child nutrition yep. issues affecting adults as they grow yes. up. Yes. So that, again, will, will have long-term prospects for the country, won't it? Yeah, and it will. You, I know you mentioned about how much they're growing at the moment, Malawi. So what do you think economically it would mean for the country if their, their population uh, isn't, if this isn't dealt with for the long-term effects of the population? It definitely. If, if somebody's not malnourished and uh, they, they don't have food in the stomach, they can't even <laughs> go mm. to school to, to learn properly. And, uh, and uh, that's the reason why we have this World Food Programme that is feeding uh, the hundreds of thousands of children with porridge, you know, in order to ensure that they, they, they have that stamina to be able to move on. But I think it can't stop there. They need to be an overhaul uh, review of the food strategy that is available, but not only that, but having a kind of a food security plan, which might be a 10 or 15 year plan to ensure that this will never 
never happen again. And I think it's a lesson again across Africa to look at it because we're talking of a country where they're losing, they, there's leakages all over in different places, up mm. to 10% leakages in some situations. So we need to revisit what plan do they have in place to address this issue of food security and to ensure that, you know, you know it's like having a, a malnutrition the kind of plan to say mm. sure that everybody at least gets certain kind of n nutrition and things like that. So how do you do that? Education is very important. Yeah. Dealing with the cultural issue, what kind of food do they eat? Uh, are they eating the wrong food that is actually contributing to what is happening? Mm. And what kind of food can you introduce into the food chain to ensure that you know this kind of issues is addressed? Sure. And Douglas, uh, you mentioned about the education aspects, but when it comes to uh, the awareness of this specific issue. We're talking about it because of the report out. Um, but when you look at other factors within the African news agenda to do with Burundi, the Central African Republic, this issue isn't necessarily a, a, as large as the others right now, but how important is it that it's addressed and tackled in this instance for the future? I mean, food is the, the, is the most basic of human needs. I mean, you can go without shelter. People sleep on the streets, unfortunately. Um, but you can't go without food. Nobody can go without food. So this is a country fighting for survival because if people are going hungry and um, they're dying as a result of it, it means if it keeps going, you see a significant decrease in the size of the population. Um, the report released um, points the fact that you have 10.7% of people who would have been of working age dying as a result of malnutrition. That's a very big number. If you take 10% out of the whole population, mm -hmm. Those are people that have contributed immensely to the growth of the country. So I think it's, it's a big issue. It's, it's just from the, the perspective from which you look at it. I mean, Malawi should make a lot of noise about this. This is, this is the Ebola crisis. They should deal with it as such. It's not, um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a secondary problem. This is a country fighting for survival. They need to ask for help. Mm. Douglas, Temi, thank you very much indeed. Profound points there. Time now for a very short break, but when we come back, we'll be asking our guests to look back across the last seven days and pick out a few of the many positive Africa stories that have caught their eye. Thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zenith, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion. Listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world, and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance, the most customer-focused bank in Nigeria. A success built on three foundations, dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue conversation with my guests this week, security analyst Temi Tope Alodo and Douglas Pollin from the Association of African-Owned Businesses here in London. Let's um, talk about the, uh, the new blueprint that the EU has uh, unveiled to deal with the uh, migration crisis. So tell us more about that. Yes, uh, what we have here is that in the last uh, few weeks you know, and months, uh, people have been dying you know, in the ocean and you know, around Europe as they try to make their way to greener pasture. And now, you know, the EU have been criticized because of their slow approach to dealing with this issue. And now they said, okay, you know what, we, we're coming up with, we're going to take 20,000 and we're going to have a quota for this. Of course, we know countries like, you know, the United Kingdom are, are showing the creative resistance, but this mm. is good news. It's better than, you know, better than not having anything at all. And I think it's a starting point for greater things that we're hoping that the, the leaders will sit around the table and look at how to address this issue. At least we have a quota now. We can now look at how and what kind of initiative we could put in place to ensure that those kind of people that are coming, that are economic migrants, are actually stopped from coming in and the people that actually need real help mm -hmm. actually get that help. Uh, Douglas, you want to talk about uh, Africa's largest refinery, uh, which is uh, taking place at the moment, of course. Uh, tell us about, more about this. Um, um, Aliko Dangothe, the richest African, is um, looking to build a new refinery in Nigeria. I think that's fantastic news because Nigeria has a chronic um, petrol problem. Uh, you see, like petroleum products are, are really scarce. Um, Nigeria imports petroleum products. Um, so, yeah, I mean, He's going to plug in like a very big gap um, in the economy and 
create a lot of jobs as well. So I think that's, that's a fantastic, um, fantastic step forward for Nigeria as a country. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's the invested about $9 billion as well. And the, the, yeah. the divide between imports and the exports will be interesting to see how that works Absolute, too as well, won't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. There we go. Temi, uh, back to you then. Uh, KFC have uh, had to apologise in South Africa, haven't they, uh, this week? So tell us more about this story. Yes, um, uh, a video appeared and here we have, you know, staff you know, of a franchise, you know, actually washing uh, chicken. <laughs> Yeah, chicken. Well, you chicken on the floor, you know, concrete, and and that really caused a lot of uproar. And you know, uh, KFC have actually come out to apologise to say you know, they have processes in place, you know, to ensure that this kind of thing never happens. And what they have done is shut that operation down and ensure that they are confident that none of those chickens they were washed sure. you know, on the concrete actually go into the food chain. And I think this is good because. Uh, you know, we're encouraged to go for fast food. And here we are, we're seeing you know, situations where it could actually be on a negative point. But at least mm -hmm. we got the good news. They've quickly apologized, and that's what we want, you know, taking actions and ensuring that such incidents don't happen again. Sure. Yeah. And Douglas, you want to talk about African-Americans settling in Ghana. Um, so this process is being criticized as being long and frustrating. So what more do we know about this? Um, at the moment, the law has, the law has just been passed, and I mean, I'm just, uh, I, I'm really interested to see how it pans out because mm -hmm. I mean, this is reverse migration. You know, a lot of Ghanaians looking to go to the states, and now Ghana has created. I think it's a model that um, can be rolled out across Africa. Um, first of all, it increase like the inflow of new skills, um, like mm -hmm. from the Black Ameri from African American population in the states. So I, I'm, I'm just waiting to see. How, how it turns out, yeah. And Temi, uh, you've spotted that Kenya has opened a, a wildlife forensic lab to help yes. prosecute uh, poachers. So tell us more about that story. Yeah, th th this is good news, you know, especially at the first of its kind where they spend about $100 million, you know, to ensure the DNA is taken out to stop these poachers because they have, you know, uh, caused a lot of challenge, you know, within, you know, Africa in terms of, you know, killing wild, uh, wild lives, you know, elephants, uh, rhinos, and, and, and this is good news that we have now have a way to ensure that this incident could, you know, could actually be stopped in its track and stop these poachers from destroying African wildlife, and I, I think this is good news for mm. our Afri lovers of you know, African wildlife. Very interesting yes. developments there for sure. My thanks then to security analyst Temi Tope Olodo and Douglas Pollin from the Association of African Owned Businesses in London, and also the author Joseph Godson Amamu, who joined Simon earlier on in the program. We're back every night with Africa Wrap at 6 o'clock GMT on Arise News. From me, though, Gavin Ramjorn, and from the entire team here in London, goodbye and thank you for watching.